Hello and welcome to Ember's Reading Room. I know what you're asking yourselves right now. No video? No book pulled out of a box? Well, Sasami-chan, I can't let you run the channel for a whole year. Well, I could, but I have other books. <laughs> Lots of them. I've seen them. Nicely organized, in a corner. Several bookshelves. <laughs> so... Now that we've done a little run and hit one of the books I know you were looking forward to, I'm going to change things up a little bit and intersperse and go back and forth between what used to be yours and what has been mine. So today we are starting on Bedtime Tales by Linda Jennings, illustrated by Hilda Offen. And wow, you're going to love this cover. That is amazing. Kind of reminds me slightly of like... Studio Ghibli, in a way? Like Howl's Movie Castle, specifically? Mm, I guess I could kind of see that. There is a dragon that's either crying in pain or in laughter. Alright, dedication for Sheeran and Karen and Emily Catherine Vickers. Oh, this edition was published in 1989, and, oh, first published in 1989, but I don't see what edition this is, what printing. But, much like Two Minute Stories, there's a whole listing here in the front. I think Lux will have to uh, take a picture of those two pages worth to put them up when we get to the end of the book. Wow. Also, how many stories do you think we'll do per video? It depends on the story. Some are longer than others. Some are only half a page. Yeah. So, let's get started. Bulb time. It's snowing, said Matthew. How awful. I thought you liked snow, said Dad. Not in March, said Matthew. Not when all the bulbs I planted last fall are just about to come up. Snow won't hurt them, said Dad. It acts as a blanket. They'll be all right, you'll see. But the next day the snow lay thick over the ground. I can't see any of my bulbs, said Matthew. All the green shoots have disappeared. At lunchtime, the sun came out and some of the snow melted away. The next day it was still sunny. Matthew went to see his garden. Dad, he cried. Through the snow poked two crocuses, one yellow and one purple. Told you so, said Dad. Seriously, that's it. Uh, can we turn back so I can at least talk about the picture? Yeah, but I told you, some are only half a page. It's like it jumped into the middle of it, and then it left you. It's just there. Kind of like life. Huh. The art is very similar to the style that's on the cover. Um, very nicely rendered. The dad's in the background. The kid's standing in a slightly odd position. I it's almost like he was meant to be holding a shovel, in a way. But I think they're just having him indicate the ground with his hand on his hip. Like, this is where my bulb should be. Fairground fun. When Penny went to the fair, she didn't look at the giant slide or the bumper cars. She turned away from the ghost train and the tilt-a-whirl. She always liked to go home with something she'd won. Last time it had been a goldfish. This time, she'd set her heart on a green china vase from the ring toss booth. She wanted to give it to Mom for her birthday, but she only had 50 cents left. What would happen if she didn't win it after all? And Mom was standing right beside her. What a horrible looking vase, said Mom. Whoever would want to win that? Oh, said Penny sadly. Do you know, said Mom dreamily, there's something I've always wanted to do for years. What's that? asked Penny. Go on a really old-fashioned merry-go-round, said Mom. On one of those ostriches, Penny smiled. I'll treat you, she said. Great, said Mom. So Mom climbed onto an ostrich, and Penny sat astride a splendid horse with flaring nostrils, and round and round and up and down they went, waving to all their friends. Much more fun than winning things, said Penny, as the ride finally came to an end. Hmm agreed mom. Thank you for a lovely birthday treat. Okay, that's an interesting little story there. They're pretty much all like this. 
Also, that horse is scary. A little bit. You're going to see for yourself, because I'm probably going to take pictures of these and have them change out, just like two-minute bedtime stories. All right, now, a spaceman in the yard. Ooh, Pikmin. <laughs> a little bit. Daddy, there's a spaceman in the yard, cried Lisa. Daddy was vacuuming the living room. Oh, yes, he said. Watch your feet, Lisa. Mommy, there's a spaceman on the grass, repeated Lisa. But Mommy was washing dishes in the kitchen and didn't have her glasses on. Don't be silly, darling. It's the bird bath. Lisa went out onto the grass. The spaceman was only very little, so she wasn't afraid. The spaceship seemed to have hit the bird bath and nosedived into a flower bed. Hello, I'm Lisa, she said politely. Can I help you? The spaceman pointed to the little spaceship and chattered excitedly. Oh, I see. You want me to get out of the flower bed for you. Lisa lifted the spaceship as easily as a toy airplane. There you are, she said. The little spaceman walked to the door of his craft and waved goodbye. Don't track dirt on the carpet, said Daddy as Lisa came in. Oh, look, Lisa, there's some kind of bird flying over the fence. Or perhaps it's a flying saucer, he joked. Perhaps it is, said Lisa. That is really cute. And just to correct myself, because I think I mispronounced the word Pikmin. <laughs> it's like, that's instantly popped into my head. Small spaceman crash lands onto a planet in a garden. At least he didn't have to collect different pieces to repair his spaceship. And this was way before <laughs> Pikmin came out. Halloween Pumpkin. Frank's dad was growing a pumpkin. It was simply enormous, but no one knew what to do with it. We get a pumpkin pie, said Frank's dad, but Mom's lost the recipe, and anyway, I hate it. We could put the pumpkin in a show, suggested Frank, but there was only a flower show in town, and they didn't want prize pumpkins. It's a white elephant, sighed Dad. It's completely useless. Suddenly, Mom had an idea. The next night was Halloween, and the family had a party in the yard. Frank dressed up as a ghost, Mom put on a witch's hat, and Dad made everyone dunk for apples. And lighting up the whole scene was a simply enormous jack-o'-lantern. And there's a, simply a pumpkin on this page. These things are really tiny. They're actually two minutes. Yes, unlike the book of two-minute stories, I can get through 10 or 12 of these probably in a recording. No, I'm not going to do 10 or 12 in one recording. <laughs> Little Spider. Little Spider felt very upset. Nobody loves me, he said. People love baby kittens and puppies and ducklings, but nobody loves baby spiders. He knew he was right. Bobby Briggs had just put little spider down Emma's neck. Take that horrible thing away, she had screamed. I hate spiders. Now little spider could see Emma coming along the road to school. Oh, she cried, spotting his web. How pretty, just like a little lace hat. Little Spider felt very proud. It was his own special dew-spangled design that he had spun that very morning. Clever little spider, said Emma. I'll never be afraid of you again. Wow, that is a pretty little design right there. I like how it mirrored things and it really surrounds a spider web. Mm-hmm. Very nice. The Lion's Escape. The lion wanted to escape from the zoo. He was tired of all those faces peering through the bars at him. And although we had a nice enclosure with trees to scratch on, there was not much space to roam around. One day a cat came to visit him at the zoo. I wish I had an enclosure like yours with trees to sharpen my claws on, said the cat. I'm not allowed to scratch anything at home. The lion thought the cat's home sounded rather cozy. According to the cat, he had a nice big furry rug, a fireplace, and a squashy armchair. Let's change places, said the lion. So the lion made his way to the apartment building where the cat lived and climbed up the fire escape to the back door. I can't take you, said the cat's owner. You're much too big. You'd eat a hundred cans of cat food a week. If you lay on the hearth, I wouldn't see the fire at all. In the zoo's enclosure, the cat was trying to find a private spot. Cats like to be private. But everywhere he looked, he could see faces. He missed his squashy armchair. I'm going home, he said. The lion padded back to the zoo, where he met the zookeeper. Guess what, said the zookeeper. Tomorrow you go to live in a safari park. There will be plenty of space for you there. Do these stories have, like, any point? 
or cohesiveness <laughs> or morals. Um, there's some Aesop's fables in here. So some. This one kind of had a moral. The whole switching places thing and finding out where you lived is just is okay, is okay is good enough is it, it works good for you. Also the a little toss in there at the end like oh actually we're gonna send you somewhere else. So you came back and we're gonna send you somewhere better. And like I was saying, there are some Aesop fables. Yes, I see them. So yeah, we do have some with points and morals. A little thing on the last story too. There's a cute image of the lion and the cat, which you'll probably see on screen. Dog in the Manger. There was once a dog who decided to live in a manger. This annoyed the horses very much. For dogs eat bones and meat, and are not the slightest bit interested in eating grain and oats and all the things that horses enjoy. But this miserable dog growled at the poor horses who tried to get to their food. Why can't the wretched dog let us be? asked the horses. He doesn't want our food and shouldn't be living here anyways. Yet he keeps us away from what is rightfully ours. Okay, I thought Aesop Fables all had points. This is basically don't be a jerk? Maybe? I don't know. I'm trying to figure out the dog came to live with them and is now keeping them from, from their food. I thought there was going to be a point where the dog was keeping them from their food because the food had been poisoned or something. No, apparently just the dog is a jerk. Apparently. All right, the wolf and the crane. A wolf once swallowed a bone, which got stuck in his throat. He was in agony and promised to give a big reward to anyone who would take it out for him. Because the wolf was an untrustworthy creature, many animals refused to help. But at last, the wolf persuaded a crane to help him. She put her long neck down the wolf's throat and pulled out the bone. And what will be my reward? asked the crane. The wolf laughed heartily. Why, the fact that I haven't eaten you up, you stupid creature, he said as he walked away. You should never expect anything from rascals. For you are sure to be disappointed. Why do these like feel almost like shortened? They are shortened. Because all Aesop's fables are longer than this. Cause remember when we read the retelling of the musicians of Bremen? That, that was much longer. Alright. One more. Because we have another Aesop one. The hare and the tortoise. Oh, not like everyone hasn't heard this one. The hare was always boasting that he could run faster than any other animal. So when the tortoise challenged him to a race, the hare laughed his head off. Of course, he said graciously, but to himself he said, This will be so easy for me that I can safely take a nap on the way. The day of the race arrived, and the two animals set off. Soon the hare decided to stop for a snooze, Why the tortoise had only just passed the starting line. The sun rose higher. The hare slept on, but the tortoise plodded ahead his thick shell protecting him from the sun. By late afternoon, the tortoise only had six feet to go to the finishing post. Suddenly, the hare woke up and realized it was nearly dark. He jumped up and ran and ran, but too late, the tortoise had beaten him. So it is that the slow, steady ones are often the ones that achieve their goal. They also like reworded the endings, because I seem to remember like the slow and steady wins the race. It's yes. usually the version that I've heard. It's typically presented as slow and steady wins the race. And I never understood in the story why the hare would stop to take a nap along the way. If you're going to outrun the guy, why not just outrun the guy, win the race, and then be free for the rest of the day? It's also, like, arrogance. Yeah, it's like, oh, yeah, I don't need all this time. That story gets adapted a lot to different things. kind of like, I think it's called Twelve Angry Men? Mm-hmm. It is a usually modern stories have to adapt it to 12 angry jurors because now you wouldn't have as high a likelihood of having a jury of 12 men. All right, so this has been the first installment of Bedtime Tales by Linda Jennings, illustrated by Hilda Offen. I took off the dust jacket, but I hadn't flipped to read the back cover. This new collection of original and traditional stories has been especially designed for young children who apparently have no attention span. <laughs> Lavishly illustrated in full color by Hilda Offen, it contains over 140 tales that are ideal for reading aloud at bedtime because they are shorter than my two-minute stories. This classic children's book, how do you get to call it classic at the time of publishing, will delight all who read it and be treasured by the whole family. It is sure to become a storytime favorite and a book that children will want to return to again and again.
even when I was younger, I probably just asked for the next story just to go, is there anything here? Because this is very, um, fluffy? Nonsensical and fluffy. Very lacking in plot. Substance? Mm-hmm. They're still, like, fun, but... There's really not much going on here. But we'll still put a link up if you want to buy it and check it out. You know, read ahead for the next hundred and... 33 stories remaining. Uh, thanks again for listening.